Hey guys, Jerry Berg here, The Poor Historian, and I am here to bring to you a new topic that I will hope, hopefully, turn into a whole series of videos going into some depth, or at least as much depth as I can, for a very obscure topic in history that I find, for whatever reason, immensely fascinating. And that would be pikes used during the American Civil War. It is such a, such a fascinating thing because this war is considered to be the first modern war full of all sorts of modern technology, machine guns, uh, gases, grenades, submarines, all of this stuff was brought to life in a useful manner during this time. Nonetheless, you still have such archaic things being used in warfare. Swords, and you have uh, cavalry charges and lances and pikes. Now, immensely deep history that unfortunately a lot of people online try to simplify into a few paragraphs or just one website um, but it does often get overlooked and it does often get uh, consolidated kind of simplified but it is a very deep and very complex topic that I hope to get into over the next few months uh, as soon as I finish my Aztec Makana thing I promise it's coming um, so what I wanted to do in this video is just kind of go over one of the reasons that I found this topic so fascinating, and that would be the variety of types, of varieties of pikes that you see used during the Civil War by the Confederates. Now, I'm only going to go into some of the standard styles. I've, I've discovered at least leads on what would be at least 12 different varieties of pikes used by uh, the Confederates and in some occasions the, the Union uh, during the Civil War. But the variety that you see here is just fascinating. Um, hopefully this will be a short video. We'll see when I get to editing it. Um, so firstly, I wanted to state, to state kind of the standard pike. So most of these pikes were centered in Georgia under the governor, uh, Joseph Brown. Uh, so what I wanted to do was start right there. Start with some of the pikes that you will see come out of Georgia, usually the Griswold Armory. Um, the first one, oddly enough, is called the Georgia Pike. Now there were thousands, many thousands of these created during the Civil War and issued to various militia and state troops and state guards, which is a whole nother story I'll get into with another video. Um, so the Georgia Pike was pretty simple in my mind. It had a, a standard knife blade, double-edged, about 12 inches long, uh, with an oval guard preventing any depth of stabbing into the blade. What's fascinating when you look at the pikes from the Civil War compared to the pikes during the Age of Pike and Shot, the, the old pikes in the, in the 1500s and 1600s did not have, or frequently did not have a guard or anything preventing uh, a deep skewer of your opponent. Whereas almost all the pikes, in fact every single one of them during the Civil War, um, had some way of preventing a deep stab through your opponent. They all had a cross guard or a, a bar or something coming off of it preventing any more than a maximum of, of probably about uh, 12 inches except for rare cases. Um, so that's what this particular cross guard, that's one of the identifying characteristics. Okay. I do want to move on to another type of pike that was common out of Georgia and this one is really fascinating and probably one of the most um, recognizable pikes during the American Civil War. Now that would be the cloverleaf, cloverleaf pike head as it's called. So it has, the reason it's called cloverleaf is because it has actually three three uh, sharp parts, three spear points coming out of it. One larger one, kind of shaped like a leaf, pointing up, and then two smaller ones sticking out on the side, making a triple threat. Uh, which, and of course, the reason, I'm not going to get into the details of the benefits of a pike that has things sticking out the side that could also kill, but they're there. Uh, and this one was made in a variety of different armories, again, mostly in Griswold, as far as I can tell. Um, and then it also was issued to a variety of troops. Now you do see a lot of these being dug as opposed to some that were commonly brought north by the, by the at that point, Union veterans uh, as kind of prizes or like curiosities from the war. 
All right, so another type of pike that I wanted to talk about uh, was one that I find very fascinating, and it's called the bridal cutter pike, otherwise known as the Irish pike. Uh, so this is a type of pike that has not just your standard pike head on it, but it also has a curved sickle-like attachment on the side. Uh, the reason that it's also known as the Irish pike is because of the famous Irish Rebellion in 1789. Uh, the pikemen in Ireland wielded a very similar, almost identical pike. Now the issue with this is that um, it's difficult to say identical because there are so many different styles of this pike that were made. Sometimes the, uh, the standard blade and the sickle part are attached as one. Sometimes they are a separate piece held on by a ferrule at the base of the spearhead. Um, and it can actually go into a lot of detail as to which type of Irish pike was uh, purchased uh, or, or issued by which general or which state. Uh, maybe I'll go into detail, maybe not. It's kind of a boring topic, but it could be fun. Now the point of the bridle cutter, the sickle part on that is exactly what it's called, to, in one way or another, uh, take out or incapacitate a cavalryman. Uh, so what you would do is you would take that sickle part and hook it around the bridle or the saddle strap or any other part of a horse that is necessary, that's made of leather, that is necessary to keep it in control. Once you snap that saddle strap or you break that bridle, that horseman, that cavalryman is no longer in charge of his animal. Uh, so that therefore it is a supposedly, in theory, a very good anti-cavalry pike. Um, another type of pike that I really like talking about is called the Richmond Pike. Now this Richmond Pike has a couple mysteries behind it. Um, <clears throat> one of them is that I can't seem to find any research on it. Every time I try to do research on it, um, more than just looking at the details of an artifact, it links me back to the Georgia Pike, which is very similar, and I'll go over that in a second. The other mystery, I'll go over that afterwards too. So the Georgia Pike um, is similar to the Richmond Pike, but the Richmond Pike, uh, in being in, in that the Richmond Pike and the Georgia Pike are both very simple. The Richmond Pike has a uh, guard on it that's actually round compared to the Georgia Pike guard, which is ovular. Uh, it's kind of act. It actually looks more like a cap, like an end cap with a hole cut in it for the blade to come out, um, not actually moving in and out, just being held in place. Um, so this Pike, like the Georgia Pike, has what are called lingettes. Lingettes are pieces of metal, strips of metal that go down either side of the uh, pike down the down the pole from the head to add strength and stability to the the end bits of the pole um, now usually and it is this case with the Georgia pike usually if you have the blade sticking out of the pike the blade is actually down in the pole in the wooden part of the pike uh, quite a ways in the tang of the spearhead and normally you'd also have the lingettes on opposite sides parallel to the way that the pike and its tang, or the pike head and its tang are in the wood. The reason being because you can stick a rivet straight through one lingette, the tang, and the other lingette, making it very stable. Um, and you'd have a few rivets straight through the pole and both lingettes uh, down the ways. <clears throat> now, the weird thing with the Richmond pike is that the pole, or I'm sorry, the tang and the spearhead are actually twisted, perpendicular to the way the lingettes are. It's so confusing to me because that seems contradictory to adding stability to the pike. The point of the lingettes is to add stability and strength, and it just seems to be counteracting that, being that they're twisted. Uh, I wish I had more ability to research the depth of it, but it, it's just there. there's very little research done on this. So maybe one day I'll get my chance um, to, to hold or at least study one of these Richmond Pikes in person. The other mystery with this is that there's no details. I'm trying to find research into why Richmond had Pikes, who made them, what troops were issued to them, what types of troops were issued to them, but there seems to be almost no research or no historical record of these Pikes, who made them, where they go, etc. Um, every time I try to find research, the, the, the website which is often very vague, always links back to the Georgia Pike, not the Richmond Pike. So, oh well, we'll figure that out. Um, 
two more types of pikes I want to go over. And the first one I'm going to go over very shortly because, again, it doesn't have very much research done on it. And that would be a curiosity called the bayonet pike. So these types of pikes were made by broken bayonets that, some way or another, broke on the battlefield. Um, well, the bayonet on the musket, it comes out and then actually from the from the barrel of the musket it sticks out to the side a little bit and then sticks out for numerous reasons but these bayonet pikes they stick straight out from the pole so at some point in their lives these bayonets or these bayonet heads had been reforged and that's obvious both because of the curve lacking in the uh, spearhead version of it but also because there's a small metal rod that is stuck through the bayonet head to act as that guard to prevent the stabs from going too far through the body that we talked about earlier. Very little records on this. I can almost I almost have no historical record other than just seeing the pike itself. Um, so hopefully I'll find more research on this. Now this last pike that I like covering, it's actually kind of two different types of pikes in one, and I like covering it because it seems to be the type of pike that actually draws people to this minor bit of history in the first place. And that would be the spring-loaded pike. So fascinating. The idea is that you have a hollow shell made out of wood that acts as the, the pole. And into that shell goes a three foot or so metal blade that you shove into that shell and it powers a spring and then you lock that pole or that blade in place so that when you're ready to fight, you'll release it. That three foot blade shoots out with the strength of that spring behind it. Then you have a very fascinating military contraption. Um, so cool, but weren't actually used. And there was one group, I'll go into the details in a later video, but basically the guy used it to show off not for actually combat. <clears throat> However, what people often mistake for a spring powered pike is actually a retractable pike. Uh, and the retractable pike is essentially the same thing, a shell made out of wood with a long blade, but you bring that blade into the shell and then lock it in place so that that blade is tight and you can march around with a stick, essentially. Then when you're ready for fighting, you can unlock it, shove it up, the blade comes out, lock it in place, and you're ready for fighting. Kind of a collapsible pike. That's a fascinating concept. Not as cool as the spring, pike but uh fascinating and very cool nonetheless the weird thing is with both the spring powered pike and the collapsible pike the point of using these weapons and giving them to your troops was to counteract the cost and difficulty in manufacturing firearms so by having these collapsible pikes the contraptions and moving parts and all that it seems to kind of counteract the whole saving money and ease of manufacturing thing um, I digress. We'll, we'll dive into that in a later video, hopefully sometime in the near future. Um, but those are the types of pikes that I wanted to tell you about. And the problem is that we just don't know too much about them. We actually see the pike. The pike is there. Uh, and in fact, that's the case with so many of these other types of pikes that I just don't have too much information on. There's pikes that look like the Irish pike that we talked about earlier, but instead of a pole arm, or I'm sorry, instead of a, a spearhead, it's actually a scythe blade, which is pretty sick thinking about it. Um, there's also pole pikes that were supposedly used by the Confederates that look just like the English bill hook. Um, but the problem is there's no records of it. We have the pike, it's there. We have the antique, we have no records about it. What do we do? What do we make of this? Well, we really have to dig. We really have to discover this history. Uh, if you would like to follow my own personal research on this and not wait for the videos to come out, I do have a Facebook page as kind of a side project of mine. It's called the Chattahoochee Rangers, named after an original um, unit that was issued pikes. Um, and I'll post the link and probably put it down here. Um, so like that page, follow my research if you're interested. I post manuals, updates, basically leads on information about who had these pikes, what types of pikes there were, what manuals there might be, etc. I also want to thank all the people that I actually borrowed the pictures from. Feel free to take a look at their site. I'd recommend it. Uh, the reason being because most of these pikes are actually from personal collections. Not a lot of museums have them and not a lot of museums that do have them post the pictures online. 
So I really want to thank these people for taking the time and taking pictures of their private collection and putting it online for our research like this. Uh, that's all I've got for this introduction to the pike. Hopefully a lot more videos will come out in this series soon. Until then, take care.